Hey everyone, back again. Today I'm going to talk about Deleuze and Guattari's notion of the rhizome and how it fits within their overall project in A Thousand Plateaus and a little bit of what is philosophy. But before jumping into that, if you want to follow me anywhere other than here, you can find me on Instagram at theory underscore and underscore philosophy or on Twitter at David Guineo. If you're new here, welcome. I'm David. I try to explain philosophical texts and ideas in a way to make them accessible to you. So if you're new, like, share, subscribe, and you'll see videos I release at least once a week. Uh, and you'll be able to go and check out all the ones I've already released, some 200 plus. So go and do that. If you want to help me out, you can do that monetarily via Patreon or PayPal as well. If you found this on YouTube, you're going to be able to find it in podcast form pretty much anywhere where you get podcasts, so there shouldn't be any ads. Or if you found this in podcast form, you're going to be able to find the specific video for this on YouTube if you're into that at all. So yeah, go do all those things. Uh, leave a review if you're listening to this on Apple Podcasts or any other podcast platform that lets you leave reviews. That would help me out a lot, and I like reading them. And yeah, don't want to burden you with more of that stuff, let's jump into a rhizome. Now, a rhizome is a term in botany. It's a term in to describe plants, and it's a term to describe stem systems that exist under plants and in the earth. Now, a rhizome is a horizontal stem system that moves through soil. Now, I say horizontal, it can go vertically, and it can go vertically in cases where its stems have acquired enough nutrients, have acquired enough water in order to expand itself in a kind of, as a kind of intensity upwards. Now this happens at the point of a stem system called a node, where the node is able to essentially expand upward or will just move upward if that's where it wants to go. Now, in order to best illustrate this, you should just really Google rhizome. All it is essentially is this stem system that looks kind of chaotic, that moves through the soil without any clear cut path or route. And the stems are capable of sending off kind of appendage stems that escape from it and go on their own way. So it is quite open to possibility to going into new territories and so on. Now its relative flexibility and freedom to move wherever it wants means that it isn't quite bound to any specific plant or tree or anything. Now this is what will contrast it with a root system. So a rhizome system is not gonna be bound to a specific tree or plant of which, to which the roots operate as a kind of base or edifice for that tree or plant. Instead, the rhizome kind of will have a life of its own. The rhizome system will do its own thing, go anywhere, create new possibilities for new plants, new uh, tubes, new, other kinds of vegetation within the soil that is, is a little bit more free. And I'm using that term a little bit loosely here, but it is open to a little bit more possibility than a root system. Now, Deleuze and Guattari think about this idea of the rhizome in order to imagine possibility and to think about the different ways that different groups of things can function among themselves. So they do not limit their discussion of the rhizome to actual plants or to vegetation or to anything like that. They suggest that a rhizome can be used to describe a pack of wolves or a pack of rats, if you call it a pack of rats, or a, even a group of people, if their actions actually correspond to these rhizomatic movements that don't resolve themselves so neatly into singular points or don't resolve themselves so neatly into clear cut easily traceable trajectories. Now they elaborate on the rhizome to say that it has six fundamental properties. In order for anything to be considered rhizomatic, it needs to follow these properties. And they go as follows. Number one, that it has the capacity to make connections. That is, it is able to expand through, in the case of the rhizome in the soil, it is able to expand through the soil to connect with other rhizomatic uh, structures and then form new connections that way to be able to make their own connections. Now, by virtue of that, the second property is that it is necessarily heterogeneous. It might all belong to the same kind of umbrella term of a rhizome, which might appear to be a way to neutralize its possibilities, but that doesn't mean that it is not still open to its own potential, even though if a rhizome is making connections with other rhizomes, it is still presenting itself to newness. Now, rhizomes can actually connect themselves to other plant systems or to other root systems, opening up this heterogeneity a little bit more. So, so far, 
the rhizome must be able to make connections, and by virtue of these connections, it must be heterogeneous. Now they expand this idea in their third property, this idea of heterogeneity, to consider multiplicities. How by virtue of opening up these connections that render it heterogeneous, it then embraces a sort of multiplicitous identity or multiplicitous identities. And these resolve themselves into different intensities, different magnitudes, like how a rhizome might structure itself into by virtue of a certain intensity that forms through these nodes, as I mentioned earlier, might form itself into I don't know, a potato or whatever other structure it might uh, form itself into. And it won't be bound by any single principle or idea. It can form anything based off of what nutrients are gonna be available to it within a certain terrain, within a certain physical, literal terrain that will give it possibility, that will, in a sense, dictate what it is capable of all the while shaping and forming that environment to its own will if we can ascribe the rhizome a will now because it is multiplicitous the fourth property will then suggest or that they suggest is that it is incapable of being resolved into a singular point so if it resolves itself if it forms a potato at one point that potato does not at all stand in for the rhizome so if any single part of the rhizome is destroyed it will only take itself up somewhere else or it will just continue its connection somewhere else that is any rupture that happens within the rhizome system, the set stem system of the rhizome, is not going to completely destabilize it because if it did, that would imply that it has resolved into a single point that comes to stand in for it. And then by virtue of that, all of the energy is allocated to this single point upon which all other aspects of the rhizome will hinge. Now the fifth property is that its trajectory is only mappable. It is not traceable. For it to be traceable, means that it is going to be replicable in a clear-cut, easy way, which implies that it is not quite as free as it might think itself to be. Whereas if it is viewed as being mappable, then that opens up a kind of negotiation where different people, if they are mapping it, if we you know, take this anthropomorphic standpoint that humans are the ones mapping these things, then it implies therefore that there is going to be some kind of negotiation where people are going to disagree upon the actual tracing, upon the actual trajectory of this rhizome. Whereas tracing it just completely replicates it, pretending as though it, it has an existence on its own that can just be easily replicated. Whereas its complexity does not allow for any such replication. Because if you look at an image of a rhizome, you can't tell where it started. You can't tell where it's going to end. You can't even locate its trajectory between the point it started there for and the point where it is now. There is no way to actually do that. All you can actually do is supply an interpretation of the rhizome that might point to its trajectory, that might give you a sense of where it will go, but it is only an interpretation. It can't be set in stone. And finally, it is transferable. They use another term that is kind of a complicated term. It's a term in French that refers to the act of like putting, um, I guess, embroideries or other kinds of flashy elements of a thing uh, upon another thing. So if you were to take, if you have a car that you happen to care about a lot and you put a lot of decals on it, taking those decals off and putting them somewhere else, implying that they are transferable. So their sixth and final property for something to be a rhizome implies that it must be transferable or its properties are transferable and aren't restricted to it because that would reduce it to a single point, a kind of single uh, kind of identity that will reduce and limit its possibilities. Now they contrast the rhizome and for something to be rhizomatic with the tree, what they call to be arborescent. For something to be arborescent means that it resolves into a singular point, in the case of like a tree that stands in for the entire root system underneath it. Whereas with the rhizome, the rhizome doesn't, as I think I've made clear, doesn't resolve itself into a single point and is therefore open to its own possibilities, its own potential to construct its own trajectory, its own lines of flight that aren't so neatly traceable. 
In fact, they can't be traced. They can only be mapped. Now they use this idea to go after, that is in a thousand plateaus, they use this idea to go after eatable psychoanalysis that reduces all of the body's emotional, intellectual, physical desire to a single point, and that is the Oedipal paradigm, that is reducing everything to one's relationship with their parents that they had in their youth. Of course, this is only uh, only really exists within a European context where the nuclear family reigns supreme. It completely ignores uh, other ways that children are raised. You know, it takes a village to raise a, a child and so on, or uh, polyamorous relationships or anything like that, that destabilize this idea of the nuclear family. So they propose then, with their own brand of analysis, to oppose, uh, or they oppose psychoanalysis just because they want to embrace all of the potentialities that are found within any given human, that any part of us is essentially uh, open to its own potential. We are not this singular being. We are comprised of multiplicities by the different desires that are going to be embedded within our hands versus those of our nose versus those of our even our hair that are going to work in different ways and do different things of their own volition. So to reduce them all to a single point, that is Oedipal psychoanalysis, is to completely limit all potential, which they do not want to do. They want to embrace a rhizomatic figure or understanding of the human, if I can even call it the human, but just for the sake of simplicity, uh, reducing the human to, they don't want to reduce the human to this arborescent singular form. They want to embrace its multiplicitous identities. And the point of this is to open up the possibility for a new world and a new people, which is an idea that I think they present the most clearly in uh, what is philosophy, uh, which is, I've actually never covered on this channel, I'm, I'm scared to, but in any case, that more or less, I think, should give you uh, an introduction to this term. What is a rhizome? Get your foot in the door to understand it in case you uh, were curious or are thinking about pursuing Deleuze and Guattari or reading into them. This might this might have helped you. If you did find it helpful, you know, tell your friends. They might get a kick out of it, or they might not, but you can try. Uh, if there's anything I got wrong, I'd love to hear about it. If uh, anything I left out that I th you think is particularly important, I would love to hear about it. You know how to leave comments. And yeah, catch you next time. Take care.